listen, happy new year. It's a new decade, 2020. Woo, get fired up. Hey, now listen, there's one person excited. That's great. Hey, listen here. I know something about a majority of the people in the room when it comes to new years. When it comes to new years, there's three kinds of people here today. There's the first kind of people and you're the minority. You're in about the 10 to 20%. You're the people that love the new year, right? Just smile, it's okay, smile. You love the new year like you have a word for the new year year. You have a three-year planner so that you can write down all your resolutions for the next couple of years. Like you're the person that's going to accomplish your resolutions. You are fired up. You are ready. You love the new you and the new year. And then there's about 40% of us in the room. And you know what you think of the new year? You don't care. That's right. The only thing about a new year that you like is it's an extra holiday off from work or from school or for something else. You're just going to keep on going like you've been going you don't really care. And then there's a third group. We make up about 40%. You actually care about the new year. You've made New Year's resolutions before, but because of the speed and because of the pace of life, if you were honest, you are exhausted. You don't care. You're just trying to make it. And I have some good news regardless of whether you're one of the people that love the new year or you're one of the people you don't care or you're exhausted. And it doesn't even matter that if you have no faith, different faith, or you grew up in church. Listen, I know something that's true of all of us this morning regardless. And I'll put it up on the screen. And this is true of all of us regardless. And it's this right here. We're going to put it up on the screen. Everyone wants to be better at life and everyone wants a better life. Listen, I've never run into somebody who goes, I want my life to be worse. Can I, where, where do I sign up for the worst life? No one ever does that, whether, regardless of how you feel about the new year, regardless of how you feel about faith. I know that you, all of us, want to be better at life and we want to have a better life. Listen, the question isn't, do we want to be better and have a better life? The question is, how? How do we get better at life? And how do we have a better life? And you already know this, and science has confirmed that better, being better at life and having a better life doesn't come from complex. Did you know that better actually comes from simple? Just simple, easy to do, everyday thing. Life change happens with simple things. Matter of fact, that's why we have this series called Five Words That Can Change Your Life. They're very simple words. Matter of fact, over the next several weeks, we're going to go over some of these words and we'll put them up on the screen. Five words, yes, yes can radically redirect your life in a way that you could never imagine. Next week, we're going to look at the word help. It's a word that we're all going to want to utter at some point. Sorry, a word that we're all going to have to say at some point in our life. Thanks, a word we should say more in our life. And the one that is hardest for us to say to ourselves, no. But over the next several weeks, we're going to look at the power that these simple words have to change our life. Now listen, if you're here or you're at Lusby or you're watching online and you're thinking, Matt, I don't believe that a word, a simple word could change my life. And and you're probably like me. I'm a skeptic. I'm a critic. You always kind of have to prove it to me. Um, I don't just take things, what people say, actually do research and then investigate it myself because I want to make sure that if I think or believe or do something that it's actually worth my time. And so you might be in Lusby or online or even here and going, are you really sure that like a word, yes, can change your mind. And so I want to ask us a question that I think might change your mind about the power, the simple power of a word like yes. And so here's a question at Lusby here in Leonardtown online. I want us to all ask ourselves this question. What does your greatest joy and your worst regret have in common? What does your greatest joy and your worst regret have in common besides you? Because, right, it's you, right? You're the common denominator. You might not want to hear that, but that was free, right? Listen, what is the common denominator? Think about this. If you're here today and one of your greatest joys is like you're in the military and you've had a great military career. Maybe you're here and your greatest joy is like you're a nurse or you're here and your greatest joy is you're a firefighter or maybe your greatest joy is you're a teacher. God bless you. We need you, right? Maybe your greatest joy is, is your profession, but you know what you had to do to have that profession? You had to say You had to say yes. Maybe your greatest joy is your child. You're like, I have a little baby. I love my little baby. That baby started with a yes. (laughs) 
right? Maybe your great, see, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Maybe your greatest joy is a hobby, something that you have, that you do, that brings you immense joy. But to start that hobby, you had to say yes. And it got me thinking, your greatest joys all started with a But think about your greatest regret that you have in life. For some of you, if you are really honest, your greatest regret is relationship. Maybe it's an ex. Maybe it's him or it's her. But your greatest regret started with a yes. Maybe you struggle with an addiction that you can't seem to give up and you wish you didn't have. And the reality is, is that addiction started with a yes. Maybe one of your greatest regrets is you're in debt. How did debt start? That credit card didn't jump out of your wallet by itself. You said yes. And here's the truth, whether you like New Year's or don't like New Year's, whether you grew up with no faith, a different faith, or you've grown up as a follower of Jesus, it is true of all of us, our greatest joys and our worst regrets all started with a simple word, yes. And it leads us to a truth this morning that you've already experienced. You didn't need to come to church for me to tell us. You've already experienced this truth. You know it. You've experienced. It is a truth in life. We're going to put it up on the screen. It's our opening truth. Sometimes our yes can dramatically alter the direction of our lives for better or for. Sometimes our yes has the power to dramatically alter alter our lives for better or for worse in ways that we could never even see or imagine. And if you're here today and you still disbelieve me that yes has the power to dramatically change your life, I want to tell you a very sad but a very true story. I know this guy, and I'm not going to give you his real name, but I'm I'm going to give you a fake name, but he's he's a real person. And I'm just going to call this real person Bob. Now this real person Bob was a young guy, he's in his in his mid 20s. And, and Bob had a really good job, the kind of job that you wear a suit and tie to that, that makes decent money. And not only did Bob have a really good job, not only did Bob have friends, Bob was really talented. I knew Bob from the powerlifting community. Matter of fact, Bob was so good at powerlifting that there's this tournament in the world that you have to have an invite to go to. And very few people in the world ever get invited to this thing for powerlifting. And I, I was actually watching this on the stream and he showed up in my gym and I was like, I saw you. You're the same guy that I saw on the screen. And he was like, yes, I'm Bob. Nice to meet you, Bob. You're awesome, Bob. Bob Bob was great in life and doing really good. Except I recently heard that Bob decided one night after drinking to drive. I mean, Bob said, yes, I I know I've drank, but I'm going to go ahead and get behind the wheel of a car and drive. And what Bob didn't know was coming was that he was going to be in an accident with a minivan, with a family, with three kids where multiple kids died. And that yes dramatically altered his life and the lives of others. And I bet sitting here right now, whether you're at Lusby or whether you're here or whether you're watching online, we can all think of a yes that we've made that has dramatically altered the course of our life. And here's, here's the problem. Because yeses have the power to create consequences that can last for a lifetime. Yet many times when we say yes, we don't know what it's going to look like on the end. And so we're stuck wondering, how do I make sure I don't say yes to things that are going to cause self-inflicted damage in my life? It leaves you and I asking one of life's most important questions. How do we make sure we say yes to things that lead to good, but how do we make sure we don't say yes to things that will dramatically alter our life for bad? Because our greatest joys and our greatest regrets all start with yes. 
And here's the good news as we start the new year. Here's the good news this Sunday morning. Listen, God knew that I would struggle with this. God knew that you would struggle with this. God knew that we would struggle with this. Matter of fact, humanity has been struggling with the right yes since the very beginning. Matter of fact, this is why Jesus came. And today we want to take a look at an encounter that Jesus has where he addresses a group of guys whose yeses change the world and change their lives and we can learn something in it. Now before I kind of go into this encounter, this eyewitness account that Jesus had with these guys, I need to tell you that this group of guys, they weren't having their best life. Life wasn't going as well as they had hoped. They had unfortunately been born in a time and a season in their country where their country had been overrun and overtaken by a foreign country and they weren't in charge of their own lives. Matter of fact, this country had come and invaded their country. Their army was at every station, at every post. Their lives were not their own. There was no self-rule. Not only were they in a country where there was no self-rule, these guys, the, kind of the process of growing up, they had been determined that they weren't smart enough or good enough to do anything other than kind of apprentice in their family business. And their family business, while it wasn't the worst, but it wasn't the best, they were fishermen. And when we catch up to them, not only are they in a foreign or an occupied country, not only are they just fishermen, they've had a really bad day. They haven't caught any fish, and that's their job. And this is where God shows up in their life. We pick it up in the eyewitness account of the gospel, Luke 5. And it says, one day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in to listen, listen to him, listen to the word of God. And so Jesus shows up. And here's what's amazing. Anytime Jesus shows up, people want to hear what Jesus have to say. There's something about Jesus. Jesus to talked about practical things that mattered to everyday people. And so he's talking to them about practical things. And then it says, he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge for the fishermen had left them and they were washing their nets. Now, I need to kind of let you know what happens is this is probably still early in the morning. The fishermen have been fishing since oh dark 30. They didn't catch anything. And so they brought their boats in and they're cleaning their nets so their nets don't rot. They get all the junk and the seaweed off of them and they're off doing the thing and they see preacher man preaching and Jesus sees these boats and so we continue on stepping onto the one of the boats Jesus asked Simon Peter its owner to push out into the water so he sat in the boat and taught the crowds so Peter's just minding his own business he's just doing his job he hasn't caught any fish he's going this is a bad day and then Jesus asked him something he says hey can I borrow your boat like, I'd like to get in your boat as you could push out in the water. That way the crowds don't crush me and I don't have to speak as loud. I can use the water, reflect my voice, and I can speak to everyone. I'll be safe. Would you mind letting me use your boat? He was asking to say a simple word, which is, and he did. He probably thought, ah, oh, that's a preacher guy. Who cares? He let him use my boat. What's, what harm's going to come from him letting you use boat? So he said, yes. So Jesus preaches on and it goes on to say this. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, he said, hey, listen, I know I'm finished speaking. Why don't you go out where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish? Now, at this point, you need to understand something. I would have loved to see Peter's expression in response to Jesus. I bet he gave him the double big old eye roll. <sighs> like, hey, preacher dude. You stick, you know, stick to preaching. I've been a fisherman. My father was a fisherman. My grandfather was a fisherman. I've been fishing my whole life. And it's the middle of the day. It's so hot. People don't even want to be here. The fish are going to be at the bottom. There's no way we're going to catch fish. And we continue in and it says, Master Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. He's like, hey, we just cleaned our nets. Didn't you, didn't you see my fingers? You saw us cleaning the nets. You're like, you barred my boat. Now you want me to go back out there and throw my net, my clean net, the net that I just cleaned, back into the water and try to catch some fish. And Peter at this point is probably, I'm going to humor this religious guy. I'm going to show him who the boss is. I'm going to show that creator of the universe who made the fish, I know a thing or two. But if you say so, I will. And it says, and at this time, their nets were so full that they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in another boat. And soon both boats were so full of fish, they were on the verge of sinking. So not only did they catch so many fish that they couldn't fill up their boat, they had to call in their other friends who had another boat. They said, come, they loaded the notes. They caught so many fish. Both boats began to sink. It was the greatest fishing day of their life. Woo, get fired up. <coughs> 
And we continue on. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. I mean, Peter was a lifelong fisherman. He knew what had happened. He knew he had given Jesus the stink eye, right? Like, oh, uh-huh, you know what you're doing. But because you say so. And then he catches more fish than he's ever caught in his entire life. And he realizes that there's something about this Jesus. God is present with Jesus. There's something about Jesus unique. He sees this miracle for what it is. And he admits to Jesus, he says, listen, Jesus, you probably don't want to hang out, out, hang out with me because I don't pick very good yeses. The yeses that I've picked haven't really led to the place I want to be in life. I've missed the mark. You probably don't want to hang around a guy like me. And I love Jesus' response. Jesus responds, for he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught. And so the others were with him. His partners, James and John, the son of Zebedee, were also amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Here's what's amazing. Here was a group of men whose lives was going nowhere. They hadn't even been able to catch the fish, which was their job. And Jesus shows up and invites them to say yes to him. And Jesus didn't invite them with a yes to follow him straight from the beginning. No, no, no. He starts with, let me borrow your boat, then throw your net on the other side, and then come follow me. And all of a sudden, these few guys have an adventure of a lifetime, and they change the world. These disciples lead to a revolution that would last longer than the Roman Empire because of a simple word that they said, which was, Yes. And so today, as we kick off 2020, I want to make three observations to help you and I figure out how should we say yes in the coming year so that we can be better at life and have a better life. And here's observation number one. We're going to put it on the screen. God regularly knocks on the door of our lives. Here's something that I know to be true in my life, and I am willing to bet is true in your life. Just like Jesus showed up at the, the fishermen when they weren't having a good day and said, can I borrow your boat? He showed up in a way that they didn't realize. I wonder if God is regularly knocking on the door of your life. I wonder where God is trying to show up in your life. I wonder if God is trying to show up in your life physically. I wonder if God's trying to show up in your life relationally where there's a relationship that needs to be restored or reworked. I wonder if God is trying to show up in your financial life to help you get that straight. I wonder if God is trying to show up in your spiritual life. I wonder if someone invited you here today or someone invited you to watch this on YouTube. I wonder if God is knocking on the door of your life through an invitation. Maybe God is knocking on the door of your life in one of those areas through a conversation that you've had with a coworker. Maybe God's knocking on the door of your life through a phone call of a family member who's reached out to you. Maybe God is knocking on the door of your life through a book. It could even be the Bible, but maybe it's another book. Maybe it's on a social media post that you saw that brings something to your mind and God is knocking on the door of your life. There's an area that isn't working, that is busted and broken. You know it, everyone around you know it, and you don't know what to do, but God is knocking. You know, here's what I discovered about God, and here's what you know to be true about all friendships. See, friendships never are forceful. You see, God is faithful to show up, and he'll knock on the door of your life, but he will never force himself on you because friends never force themselves on other people. See, in love, God gives you and I dignity. And just like Jesus showed up in these fishermen's life and said, can I borrow your boat? Why don't you throw the net on the other side? Why don't you come follow me? I wonder today, where is God knocking on the door of your life? Matter of fact, God says it this way. In Revelation 3.20, he says this. He says, look, I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. 
you know this and I know this. Force love isn't love. God loves you, but he will never force himself into your life. And I wonder today, I bet if you really thought there was a time in this last week where God knocked on the door of your heart in an area that he wants to show up. True story. Uh, back right after I first got married, I really didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I was working for my adopted dad um, in one of his businesses, and it was going really well. And I was kind of advancing and, and providing for my family. Um, and I got this call, though. I got this call from one of my friends that I'd gone to high school with. He was the best man in my wedding. His name's Sam. And Sam called me, and he was calling to ask me to give money. He was going to work for a nonprofit organization. You may have heard it called Young Life. Young Life works with high school and middle school students. And he was calling me to ask for money. And we were married, um, newly married, and we had money. We just didn't know it because we didn't have a budget, and we should have budgeted. We should have managed our money instead of letting it manage us. That's free. You don't need anything extra for that, right? And so, so anyway, he called me and said, hey, can you get money? And I said, we don't have any money. We did. I just didn't know it, right? But I, I did say this. I said, hey, listen, if you ever need me to, like, volunteer help, it's, it's students, I, I'd be willing to do that. And he said, are you serious about that? And I said, yes. And he says, i tell you what, um, let me let me." do some checking and I'll get back to you. And eventually he called me back and he invited me to go to something called Young Life Camp. And it's where Young Life leaders take students that they've been working with all year long and they take them to this most beautiful camp. And for a week they get to do all these crazy things and every night they get to hear about Jesus in a way that makes sense to high school and middle schoolers. And at the end of the week, it's amazing because you'll see hundreds of kids who will stand up and say yes to Jesus. And I remember my friend Sam who invited me to go to that. God was knocking on the door of my life. And I said yes, and it eventually led to going into full-time ministry. Just like Jesus showed up in their lives. I wonder, I believe that God is knocking on the door of your life in an area. Is it with a relationship? Is it spiritually? What step is God asking you to say yes to? Because your yes has the power to dramatically alter your life. Which leads me directly into observation number two, which is this. We need to admit that sometimes we say yes to things that harm us. Can I get an amen? I mean, if I was going to say I had a fault, here's my fault. I fool myself better than anyone in the world. And I will often say thing, yes to things that feel good, but aren't good for me. I mean, can we just all admit, can we just all admit it in 2020 that just because it feels good doesn't mean it's good for you. Yet oftentimes we, if we are really honest, we'll say yes to something that feels good, even though we know, we know, we know it's not good. But because it feels good in the moment, because it's easy, we choose to say yes. And then when we get the consequences of our yes, we go, where were you, God? And just like, isn't that what Peter did? After they caught all the fish, he looks at Jesus and he admits something that all of us, if our lives are ever going to be better, if we're ever going to be better at life, we have to be truthful with ourselves is, is that sometimes we say yes to things that harm ourselves. Your greatest regret is that you said yes. My greatest regret, I said yes. And if I'm honest, I am not always the best at picking yeses. I mean, this is how stupid I was when I was a teenager. Now, I was a real moron before I knew Jesus, and I was mostly a moron after I knew Jesus, but I hit my head against the wall enough times to just go, yes, Jesus, now, because I hit my head. But when I was younger... There was a craze going on, and it wasn't a very good craze. Um, and involved um, this, this chemical, and this chemical you could find in most office places. Um, and kids had got it in a habit of huffing it, but it could kill you. Matter of fact, in the community that I lived in, there had been several kids who had, who had OD'd and died. Um, and do you think that would stop a knucklehead like me? Nope. Stole it, did it, burned brain cells, surprised I am still alive today and that I'm able to function. It's amazing. You guys are listening to me like I'm shocked. But I know this, that I say yes to things that harm me. 
And it leaves me asking, I bet we could all think within the last couple of weeks, did we say yes to that extra piece of chocolate cake that we knew we didn't need to say yes to, but we said yes anyway. I mean, I wonder how many of us said yes to spending more money than we should have. We said yes to that illicit site that popped up on our phone or our computer. We said yes to one more drink that we really didn't need or shouldn't have had. We said yes to a thought or an action that we knew was hurtful. That doesn't lead to the kind of life and the kind of person we want to be. And at some point for us to be able to be better at life and to have a better life, we have to admit that sometimes we say yes to things that harm us. Which leads me, I mean, and listen, the scripture tells us, I love what it says in this, we're gonna put it up on the screen, First John it says, if we say we have no sin, and, and sin, I wanna stop here because people mess up the word sin. Sin has such a religious connotation. Sin just simply means to miss the mark. Sin simply means that we miss the mark, that we get it wrong. If we say we never get it wrong, we deceive ourselves. There are no perfect people. And then there's no truth in us. Like, listen, we all get it wrong. We all say yes to things that harm ourselves and harm others, right? But here comes the good news. It says this, but if we confess our sins, if we just admit, hey, God, we get it wrong. God will keep his promise to do what is right. He will forgive us. Is anyone here in need of, I'm in need of forgiveness. That is great news. There's no sin that the blood of Jesus can't forgive of our sins, and here's what gets better, and he will purify us from all wrongdoing. It's not just that we get forgiven. God can do something so that we don't make the same stupid mistake over and over. Isn't that good news? Like sometimes we have to learn to say the right yeses so we don't end up in bad places. And if we're willing to admit God not only forgives us, he gives us the ability and teaches us how to say the right yeses so we don't end up in the same old place over and over and over again. We just have to admit it. Which leads me directly into observation number three. Yes to God leads to better, but not always to easier. Now, look, come on. All of us wish that God was like Oprah. You get a car, you get a car, and you get a car. Right, like isn't that what we wish is that just God was, you know, up in heaven. He was some like benevolent old grandfather who would just give us whatever we want. But God isn't like that because God is good. God is wise. God is smart. And he knows giving us everything we want is sometimes bad for us. And so listen, good isn't always easier. And if we are really honest, easier isn't always what is best for us. Sometimes Hard is actually good for us. And sometimes good is just good and it isn't easy, but it leads to best. I mean, think about the disciples. They said yes to Jesus. They walked away from the biggest catch of fist. They said yes to Jesus. It eventually cost them their lives, but they changed the world. Better, but not easier. And if we're really honest, what we want to do is go, I want to come to church. I want to put a little something in the offering. I want to help a little bit somewhere. And then I want it to be easy. I want to get a pass. I hope by saying yes to God that I get a pass from all the pain, all the problems. I don't want to catch the flu. I want everything to work right, right? And here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus is a truth teller. Nowhere does Jesus say following him equals easy. Matter of fact, here's what Jesus tells us in John 16, 33. He says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Listen, we already know the end. He wins. See, the tomb is empty. See, that means death has no hold over you and I. Dysfunction, death, injustice, God has conquered all. We have peace. We know how it ends. Here on this earth, you will have, what's the word? Many trials and sorrows. Jesus doesn't say, listen, come follow me and you get a pass, you get a pass, and you get a pass. That's not how it works. Sometimes saying yes to, what, to God means it is good, it is better, it's not necessarily easy. I one time had a friend tell me, he's like, you know, people follow Jesus as a crutch. And I go, really? 
And I go, why would you think that? And they're like, well, because you like need God. I go, have you ever thought about if you actually follow Jesus, what that means? And he goes, what do you mean? I'll go, well, if you really follow Jesus, then you don't use drugs or alcohol to medicate your life. You just go through the hardness of life, trusting God. Which do you think is harder or easier? He's like, I hadn't thought about that. I go, think about your sexual purity. Do you think it's easier to just do whatever you feel like doing with whoever you want? Or do you think it's harder and to go, I'm going to be pure. I'm going to be married to one person. I'm going to honor God with my sexuality. When it comes to your financial resources and surrendering to God, saying it all belongs to him and he can use it however he wants. Do you think it's easier to do that as a follower of Jesus or easier as a person who isn't a follower of Jesus? And what do you think? It's harder to follow Jesus. It is the best thing that you will ever do, but it is not easy. Anyone that looks at you and says, oh, it's easy, anybody can do it, they're lying. Anyone can do it. It's simple, but it's not necessarily easier. And if I had to sum it up, because it's really warm in the auditorium and I don't want to lose you guys, it says, when we say yes to Jesus, we protect. See, here's, here's the thing. We all think when we say yes to God that like we're doing God a favor. Hey God, I said yes to you. Do you see me do that thing that I was supposed to do? And God looks down and goes, you don't get it. Your yes doesn't help me at all. God's still God, whether you say yes or no. Who does saying yes to God actually protect? Ourselves. It protects ourselves from harmful yeses. When we say yes to Jesus and we allow him to guide our yeses, you know what it does? It protects us from our own stupidity. And you might go, I don't need to be protected from my own stupidity. And I go, that's not true because you have regrets. All of us have regrets. Which means we need someone to show us the yeses that lead to life and help us avoid the yeses that lead to bustedness and brokenness. Saying yes to Jesus just protects ourselves from our own stupidity. I want to close with a very true story. When I was younger, I was was a mess. I was chaotic. Just my mom died when I was young. I was incarcerated at 12 and a half. My dad took me to the police station. He didn't want me. I spent almost four years in the juvenile justice system. When I got out of the juvenile justice system, I got sent to a foster home. Um, And the foster home was crazy. There was me and one other kid um, in this foster home. Um, And it was kind of crazy. Um, I need you to understand, when I got out of juvie, um, I was an addict. Um, I had all kinds of bustedness and brokenness. The system didn't make me better. It just taught me to be a better criminal. And that's how I came out of the juvenile justice system. And I remember I was in this foster home, um, and there was this other kid. I can't even remember his name. But I remember one time he was talking to me. He says, hey, um, I heard there was these really pretty girls at this church. Do you want to go with me? Like, think about this. He's, he's at, we're both ex-cons. Like, I'm, I'm a dope-smoking, like, just heathen. Like, I, w- I wouldn't spit in your ear if your brain was on fire. Like, I, I just, you know, like... Why would I ever go to church? Like, that is the stupidest, dumbest thing. Why would you invite me to church? But he said, pretty girls. And so I was a teenage boy. I don't, I don't know. And for some crazy reason, I believe God was knocking on the door of my life. And so I said yes to going to this church. Just the stupidest thing you would have thought of, right? And it was a church a lot like this that met in a school. But that simple last, yes, you know what it led to? I went to that church and I met my adopted mom and dad who eventually became my parents and took me in and gave me a place to live. That church that I went to that I said a simple yes is where I met my future wife who I've been married to for 25 years. She's a homecoming queen and awesome. And if you're asking if I'm bragging, a little yes. And it's where I said yes to Jesus, which has forever changed my life. All from a simple word called yes. And it leaves me wanting to ask you whether you're at Lusby or whether you're at here or whether you're watching online. Where is God knocking on the door of your life that you should say yes? What step has God been prodding or putting on you to say yes to 
Because here's something I know to be true. If you want 2020 to be different, then you have to do different. Different doesn't come with the same. Where do I? Where do you? Where do we need to say yes to God so that we can be better and have the kind of life that Jesus died for? Let me pray. Hey, God, thank you that you faithfully show up in our lives, God. God, that you show up and that you invite us. God, sometimes it's in our physical area of our lives. Sometimes it's in our spiritual. Sometimes it's in our relational lives. Sometimes it's in our financial lives. God, I believe that every person that's here today or that will watch this video or hear this voice, God, I believe that you are knocking on the door of their life. And God, I pray for every heart that knows exactly where it is that you're knocking, God. God, I pray that we would say yes. Maybe it's to serving. Maybe it's to getting in a small group. Maybe it's saying yes to going to celebrate recovery, to, to work on their addiction. Maybe it's to say yes to getting and making a relationship right. God, we don't know what it is. But God, our prayer today is that we would say yes to Jesus to protect ourselves from the yeses. Because a simple yes can dramatically alter and to change the course of our lives. Saying yes to you will help us be better at life and have a better life. May we hear your small, still voice. And may we say yes to you. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name, and everyone who agreed said, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.